There's more to Kings Island Tricks and Treats Fall Fest than just trick-or-treating. Sure, you'll find rides, hay bale mazes, and pumpkin decorating, but you'll also find craft beer tastings and seasonal cocktails, pumpkin bread pudding, and Day of the Dead fries. It's all here at Tricks and Treats Fall Fest, only Saturdays and Sundays now through October 31st. Enjoy unlimited visits this year and next with a 2022 Gold Pass, only at visitkingsisland.com. It's amazing in here. You should be saving for the future, but savings accounts suck, and investing can be scary. We combine the ease of savings with the real returns of investing. We call it Save Vesting, and it's only available in our new app, Stairs. Stairs offers 4 to 6% returns, no fees, and you can withdraw anytime. Do your future a favor. Visit StairsApp.com today. The following is a Hoop Bowl presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Someday soon, we might see someone take a free throw again, but so far, it's pretty much just Giannis. That's the story of the day. I don't have a full eight-minute rant planned for the beginning of today's podcast. I know you guys really like the show opening. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me tell you about whatever. But first of all, I'm still battling this stupid cold. Who the hell gets colds right now? We've all got masks on. How does that even... Oh, right. Children. Yeah, that's a thing. Anyway, welcome to Fantasy NBA Today, everybody. I'm your host, Dan Bespris. We got Brewski coming up in a couple of minutes here on this delicious Friday edition of the show. You, of course, can follow me on Twitter at Dan Bespris, D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S, or just Google Dan from Hoopball. You can follow Aaron on Twitter at Aaron Brewski. We tried to make it easy on you guys. It's just our name. Although I'm sure if you just Googled Aaron from Hoopball, that would be an easy one. Or how about, like, Aaron who made Hoopball? Story of the early season. That's what we'll be talking about here on the show it's certainly free throw stuff without question and injuries are cropping up already sounds like lebron has been upgraded to a game time decision which usually means he's gonna go and i i gotta think he's gonna push himself a little bit i would also imagine that the internal concern with the lakers is probably a lot less than the external concern because we are in extreme overreaction mode in the NBA community. And it's so frustrating. I'm pulling my ever-loving hair out watching the reactions to this stuff. You guys know, you guys listen to this podcast all the time. How many times, right at the start of the season, did I say, give the Lakers until Christmas. Give the teams that have massive turnover different lengths of time based on what the usage rates are of the guys they're bringing in and how many bodies they brought in. And then you get your answer and back the teams that have a ton of consistency season over season. There are always going to be exceptions to that rule. Bulls have gotten off to a pretty good start and they had some pretty good turnover out there. Uh, Celtics not off to a great start, not a ton of turnover. So there are always going to be examples, but, you know, the Knicks brought in a little bit of scoring, but for the most part, they're the same core. Hornets off to a good start. They're generally the same core. The Heat off to a good start. They're the same core. The Jazz were the easiest thing to handicap on planet Earth. Just a good team that's mad about being slighted despite being very good last year. Mavs are 3-1, and even though Kristaps Porzingis is out, and the team, frankly, hasn't even looked very good yet. The Wolves were good at the end of last year. They were an easy team to handicap. Consistency plays. Turnover doesn't. But if you're not overreacting right now, you're not having any fun. So I got to be the damn curmudgeon. You guys might think I actually like being the curmudgeon with as often as I have to do it. I don't really like it. I would much prefer to just get weird. But someone's always got to be there to talk people down, and this is the ultimate talk-you-down part of the season. Or talk-you-up, depending on what side of the coin you're looking at here. 
We are 10 days into a season that's basically 175 days long. We're losing our minds right now. Every little thing. What's real? What's not? Can we just please take a small step back? And look at Thursday's results. Six games yesterday on Thursday. Atlanta at Washington. Wizards off to a good start this year. I saw... I'm sorry, I wasn't done with my show opening rant. I lied. I lied. I wasn't done. I saw legitimate beat writers and, like, national ESPN, the the brainiac dudes on those websites. Not the talking heads. The brainiacs that are, like, turning Russell Westbrook into three veterans was the move of the offseason. Please talk to me in four months. They said the Wizards, they're legitimate playoff contenders now. We are five games into the season. I like what the Wizards are doing. But let's be clear here. They won that game yesterday because they only had six turnovers. They got outshot in that game yesterday, 55 to 47%. They out-rebounded Atlanta 51 to 43. They are currently playing harder than the competition. The Wizards are not going to be a team that wins 80% of their ball games. Will they be fighting for a play-in spot? I hope so, because I have Bradley Beal freaking everywhere. So if that team stays relevant, that means my head-to-head teams last longer into the playoffs. So I badly hope that they are decent this year. But they're not going to be the three seed. And have we all already forgotten that Russell Westbrook, who, by the way, how many times have I told you guys never draft him in fantasy? But we have to put our damn thinking caps on here for a minute he literally dragged that wizards team into the playoffs last year the rest of those guys were bums the second half russ did that i had to give him credit it didn't feel very good i don't want to give russ credit because fantasy wise he's a a pain in the neck more than anything else but he did that last year you're telling me you wouldn't rather have russ over montrez harrell kcp and kyle kuzma Oh, but we're five games in, so these are like the these are the smart people saying this on ESPN. Please, please, people. Do we have to re <sighs> In any event, Montrez is having a really nice start to the year, and of course he's got this wide open lane while Daniel Gafford is out. Another panic name out there. Get it together, people. Gafford was number eighty before the game he got hurt. Everybody thought he was gonna play like twenty nine minutes a game this year. No one said that. We all said, get 22 minutes out of him, and he'll be inside the top 75. And he was basically on pace for that without rebounding. And that was going to come up. Hopefully he's back soon. Gafford, by the way, is an intense buy low right now. If you can get your hands on him, if somebody's freaking out about Daniel Gafford. He's an easy one. Montrell's got a nice... Montrez, excuse me, has a nice role. Called him Montrell. Muted the wrong letter. Learn how to talk, Dan. KCP, we're not buying into that. Kuzma, we're not buying into that either. We know how things go for these dudes. KCP obviously uh, doesn't have the same deficiencies as Kuzma does. Nice to see Bradley Beal kind of get it going a little bit yesterday. 27-8-8 with a block. That was good. On the Atlanta side, Cam Reddish had 20, and he's the talk of the town right now. He's the bell of the ball, except he's number 130 in nine category leagues. So as great as things have looked on the exterior, he's done literally nothing besides shoot 13 times a game. His whole fantasy game right now is just scoring. That's an overrated category. So as nice as he's playing, it doesn't translate all that well to fantasy. Clint Capella dealing with a sore Achilles. He'll be fine. Don't panic there. DeAndre Hunter still playing most of the small forward minutes, but not really doing anything with them, which makes him kind of a tough guy to hang on to. But I think you probably have to a little bit longer. And then Bogdan Bogdanovich, signs of life in yesterday's game. That's a good sign I, you know, there were, I don't think there was anybody that was really contemplating a drop on Bogdan, but this is at least the needle kind of moving in the right direction. Detroit at Philadelphia. Pistons made a little run late by, you know, letting Kelly Olynyk play basketball. He was great. 14-5-3, and three, two steals, a block, a three-pointer. I, I really do believe that Olynyk has his role ramp up. Maybe it's possible that his role kind of ramps up and then back down. His might... His playing time this year might look like a very shallow hill like a little hilltop starts low moves up slowly comes back down as the team goes into full tank mode 
he's too good to be just screwing around with center minutes, but that's kind of what they did yesterday. Isaiah Stewart only played 18 minutes, struggled. Luca Garza chewed up five center minutes when Stewart got into foul trouble late in the first half, but they rolled to the Linux. He was playing better. At some point, they're going to have to move bodies down the board. Playing Josh Jackson 25 minutes a game is criminal when you could go a little bigger and run Jeremy Grant at the three. He could handle it. He's hugely inefficient. That's kind of rough to have as your power forward anyway. I like Jeremy Grant, by the way. He's, uh, he's on a few of my fantasy teams this year, as I thought a relatively safe, like, 80 range kind of grab. But this, this discussion is about Olenek. You're not panicking Isaiah Stewart. He's too good in the minutes he gets. And you're not panicking on Olenek. Also too good in the minutes he gets. Those are the guys that you should be hunting for at the beginning of this season. Not the boring, plodding top 100 types. Take swings at this part of your team. I will say, though, Isaiah Stewart was getting overdrafted. We talked about that a lot during draft season. Thought there was a chance that Olenek coming to town would push his ADP back down the board, and it just didn't really do it. Philly's annoying. Tyrese Maxey finally had a better ball game pretty much at the moment I gave up on him, and it was largely because he hit six of his eight shots. Got in the mix on the rebounding and assist side of the package. Had two blocks. A lot of it feels relatively unsustainable. Seth Curry cooling off a tad, but still profiles better as the high-percentage three-point guy. Hang on to Curry and Nine Cat. If you want to keep streaming Maxi, you can. I've put him kind of on my... I don't want to say chopping block, but if I can find somebody with a little more full-season appeal, that's the direction I'm going, because it sounds like Ben Simmons isn't that far away. And Philly's doing fine... That's probably the nicest way I can put it. They're doing fine, but they don't look good, and they don't look happy at 3-2 and two so far. They should be better. Whatever. Utah blew out Houston. Too easy, coach. This is barely a basketball game. Christian Wood, safe play on the Houston side, and he might be the only one right now. I have Jay Sean Tate in a few spots. I'm going to stick with that there. Generally, he sees... I mean, he actually put up pretty good stats in only 15 minutes, but he just couldn't shoot, and they got blasted so everybody who had a Rockets jersey anywhere near them just threw it on and got into the ball game they played them all 15 to 20 minutes in this game uh Alpern Shengun got 24 minutes in garbage time 14 5 and 3 steals he remains more of a luxury stash type he's looked really good so far stat wise but he's number 150 in 19 minutes a game so there's that stuff where it's like you can see the outlines of something beautiful but it's going to take more than 18 minutes a game. And that number is probably not going up in more competitive ball games. You'll see more Daniel Tice, unfortunately. You'll see more Eric Gordon. You'll see more Jay Sean Tate, which you should anyway, but you see how that goes. And then uh, Kevin Porter Jr. hurt his ankle in the third quarter. He was on his way to another middling fantasy performance I tried, man. I really tried. Kevin Porter, number 206 in nine category leagues right now. By the way, I know everybody's overreacting to stuff. Don't overreact to that. That's what you guys bought on fan- on draft night. Truly horrible percentages and very few defensive stats. And actually, his steals are above his career mark right now. Yeesh. Knicks beat the Bulls in a fun one. I told you on the pod yesterday I thought the Knicks would win this game. They were up by 10 most of the night, and then Chicago made it tight late. Bad news out of this one, though. Patrick Williams got fouled on his way to the bucket, fell hard on his wrist. We now know it was fully dislocated, and he will miss the season. That's a blow to Bulls fans. Young kid coming around, just couldn't shake the injury bug to start this year for whatever reason. He had the ankle thing, then the shoulder thing, and now he's just done. Alex Caruso's minutes are pretty much now locked in, etched in stone. He's worth adding for his steals appeal. Uh, No one else really on the Bulls picked up any additional minutes yesterday. Javante Green played 16. He got a little bit more run. And I've got to think Chicago now is going to be hard in the market for some sort of power forward level buyout. This is good news if you have DeMar DeRozan because he slides now closer to the bucket at both ends of the floor. That's better for defense. That's better for your field goal percentage. Not that we're that worried about that with him. It'll all come back to the norm. But uh, the Bull team playing better together than I would have expected through a first couple of ball games. Couldn't quite handle the Knicks, who got a well-rounded performance from Julius Randle. 
Um, he'll be fine. I mean, we know where he's going to settle in at the end of all this. Randall's number 15 right now. Steals and blocks are on their way down, as they always are. Everything else will come down a little bit too, and he'll settle back in that probably 40 range where he was last year per game. Kemba Walker, absolutely the story on the Knicks side. 29 minutes, 21, 4 and 2, two steals, five three pointers. Confident Kemba. Confident Kemba has reared his head the last two games. Three slow ones, two good ones, and it moved him into the top 60. I don't really know what Kemba we're going to get over the entire year. Right now, he's shooting over his head, field goal percent at 49. He's not getting any free throws because no guards are this year, but he's only making .6 out of one per ball game. He's three for five on the season. Threes are very high. Assists are pretty low. It's been a weird bag so far for Kemba, and I think a lot of that changes as he settles into whatever his role might be. But it's just good to see him now with a role and finding himself. And as he gets good, as he becomes confident, Kemba, Evan Fournier, Derek Rose, those are guys that are going to take little hits here. Fournier's the safer play of those two because he's starting and getting 30-plus minutes a game. And it's Tibbs, so, you know, unless you have an arthritic knee, you're going to play 34 minutes a game. Uh, and then Rose, who's always banged up, he's the sort of break-in-case-of-emergency option. Dallas fell behind 25-5 to in this game, right out of the shoot, and then won it. NBA's weird, man. DeJounte Murray looks good so far. Jakob Pertl looks real good so far. Lonnie Walker got the start for the injured Doug McDermott and was less than inspiring. My guy Derek White. Couldn't shoot the ball yesterday, but did have seven assists, a steal, and a couple of blocks. Great defensive stats from the point guard spot. Uh, no changes on the Spurs side. Maxi Kleba filling in, a, well, it's hard to say filling in because he came off the bench for 29 minutes, but basically filled in for Kristaps Porzingis. Double-doubled with four threes and six blocks. And if you fell nose first into Maxi Kleba last night, congratulations because you got easily his best game of the year. And I'm talking about from now until the end of the season also. I thought maybe Dwight Powell would step into a couple of those minutes, but it seems like they really want to keep him locked in around that 24-25 mark. Luka Doncic off to a slow start this season. But again, if you were drafting Luka as a first-rounder, you had to be punting stuff. He's number 55 right now. He'll be better than that as we sort of grind along here this season. He'll, he'll probably move into the, I don't know, between 25 and 35 9-cat. Higher than that eight cat, of course. He's got five plus turnovers a game, but he just he finds a way. His team finds a way. Jalen Brunson's actually been really good. I want to talk mostly about Brunson and Dorian Finney Smith in this one. Although I do kind of I want to move a little quicker here. I know we're almost done. DFS, Dorian Finney Smith, 32 minutes, 14, 8, 2 steals, 3 three pointers. To me, he's like basically walking into top 90 value on that team, playing full starters minutes. I think he's a guy that needs to be rostered in basically any nine-category type of league. And then with Brunson, the verdict is still kind of out. He's number 92 right now, which I know is just what we were talking about with Finney Smith, and he's back of that because Dorian's only shooting 36% so far this year. But with Brunson, there's always this sort of nagging suspicion that he might just not play on a given night. He might just get 12 minutes one game. And you just have to be okay with it. But he's very much the only other real ball handler on that team right now. His assists are way up so far. And his scoring's been good. Partially because Kristaps Porzingis was out. But also partially because Mavs are kind of going hot hand style. Like usual with, look, if somebody's not scoring, get someone the ball who is. And it's put a dent into Tim Hardaway. It's put a dent into what we might have thought might come from Reggie Bullock because he's the dude who slid into the starting lineup yesterday. And that's the fear, is that if Hardaway or Bullock is having a good ball game, then how does Brunson get enough touches when he really doesn't do much besides, and he had seven rebounds yesterday, but that's heavily unsustainable, doesn't do much besides score. We just talked about this with Cam Reddish, and then a little bit of assisting this year. And he's not a great foul shooter, pretty good field goal percent guy. I just, I'm finding it now hard to fully trust any of those three guys although I know last week I said it seemed like Tim Hardaway was going to have enough of a role to really to solidify fantasy value and he's number 93 so far so it's possible he really still does but Brunson is 
right on the other side of the fence for me. He fits more into a streaming department. And then Memphis beat Golden State in overtime. John Morant's dream start to the year continued. 37-5, and five, four steals, two three-pointers. So much about what Jaw's doing right now is not sustainable, and I'm ready to be yelled at by all of you guys, but I'm also here to tell you you can go get a top 25 guy for Ja Morant right now because he is so fun to watch in real life. That's a good thing for the NBA. That's a great thing if you're a fan of the Grizzlies or just basketball in general. And it's great because we can take advantage of it in fantasy basketball. If you happen to have Ja Morant on your team, please look at this without your Grizzlies colored lenses. He's averaging 30, 5.5, and, and 8 with almost two steals half a block, almost three three three-pointers a game, 54% from the field, and 84% at the free throw line. We are talking about numbers that nobody has put up in the NBA. No one shoots 54% for a season with 30.5 points and three three three-pointers and gets rebounds and eight assists and steals and makes their free throws. It doesn't happen. You can go back and look at Steph's MVP campaign. He wasn't this good. And then if you compare it, and listen, I get it. Guys get better in off seasons. Guys make small leaps. The Brandon Ingram free throw stroke leap was crazy. And then he also added three pointers. But Ingram steals and blocks have come back down to their average from before that. Four things don't all happen at the same time and last for a whole season. It just doesn't happen. John Morant shooting 60% from inside the three-point line right now. First two years of his NBA career, he was at 50%. Josh shooting 45% from three-point land this year. First two seasons in the NBA, he was around 30. I will give you the possibility that his free throw percentage is getting better. He's a, he's a guard with a good shot. I didn't... It was hard to believe that it was going to stay in the low to mid-70s anyway. Jumping all the way to 84, 85, that's a pretty big leap. But just for this argument, we'll just say it's going to stick. But right now, his crazy high-volume field goal percent contribution is part of why he's where he's at. If you just bring that back down anywhere near his career mark, it becomes it goes from being a big positive to a small negative. He falls two rounds if you change that number. Because also the scoring goes with it. Ja may, may, may make a leap this year. I will, I will grant all of you that. The fact that he was as good as he is at basketball, but sitting outside the top 200 didn't really make sense from a lot of perspectives. But top 10? It's not happening. People are like, oh, well, maybe he comes back a little bit. Yeah, he's going to come back a little bit. Go see if you can get a top 25 guy for him. You will be very grateful in two months. Pretty much a promise on that one. DeAnthony Melton, seven defensive stats. Steven Adams didn't play as much in this ball, ba- uh, ball game. Xavier Tillman got 22 minutes off the bench, and that could upend our start the starters theory with Memphis, so keep an eye on that. And on the Warriors' side, Draymond Green had eight defensive stats. Take that, DeAnthony Melton. Dre starting to settle in a little bit. Had that ridiculously bad free-throw shooting start. Still is, shooting 35% from the line so far this year. If you remove... The weirdness of the free throws with Draymond, because he was hovering in the high 70s. I think he even hit 80 briefly last year. And presumably, he'll get back somewhere near that mark. If you just assume he is league average in foul shooting so far this year, he's number 49. So just assume that's going to happen, and assume you're going to end up with, basically, the number 49 guy. With upside, by the way. I think he could go beyond that as the team ends up with clay and then the assists keep going the right direction so you guys know i love me some dre i don't think he's a buy low anymore after nearly going five by five in this ball game but you never know okay enough on yesterday okay guys i've been working on a trick i need you guys to visualize something with me because this is an audio podcast i'm currently holding a a little a biscuit in my hand brew speak is it, is it- is it a cheddar biscuit? Speak. Oof, oof. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so I knew the trick would work. Now roll over. 
uh, um, I'm, I'm rolling over. <laughs> no, you can't. You're too, I'm miming it. Yeah, you got too many busted limbs to roll over. That was a bad. I shouldn't have gone down that path. Hey, yeah, big I'm, dog. I'm out for three months now. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> you got the. Yeah, you got that Chris Dops, uh treatment going on right now. What's up, big dog? Arf, arf. <laughs> Speak. I knew the trick would work if I if I tried it enough times. Uh, how you doing, man? What's up? You're a week in. You all right? You good? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just rocking along. And, uh, the, you know, the body's always the question. And, uh, I, I kind of pushed it to the, to the limit to get everything in. And, uh, you know, just now it's like chilling out a little bit. And, uh, I got asked, you know, about wager pass stuff. And it's like, Hey, I'm just going to get the body chilled out. And then we're doing some crazy stuff. And Dan, obviously, you know about all this, but we're doing do. some crazy stuff behind the scenes, some huge new developments. Oh, boy. Hold on. As you say, hold on to your butts. Hold on to your butts. The greatest line in action. That's Samuel, movie. right? That is Samuel L. Jackson from Jurassic Park. Man, that guy is amazing. Hold on to your butts. What a great, what an unbelievable line. What a, like, no one in their right mind could have thought we can cr- come up with a kid friendly line for him to say here that will become a meme for the next 26? How long was Jurassic Park? Chain smoked like 500 cigarettes. Yeah. Probably just filming that one scene. <laughs> Wayne Knight was amazing in that film. You know, our old Lakers writer, you know, we were, we were piloting a Lakers writer, he used to go uh, hang out with that guy. That's true, actually. This is true. That's, now you're going way back. He, I, and he said he was like the greatest dude in the world. Yeah, I had. So I'm, I'll pull back the curtain a little bit here and then we'll dive into some fantasy because I know people are like, why do you and Brew talk about fun things sometimes? Um, so I went to I went to high school with Samuel L. Jackson's kids. Uh, I went to sort of a fancy pants high school. Um, I am not what you describe as a fancy pants person. Uh but there were a lot of very famous children at my high school, and one of my friends actually dated his daughter. And can confirm he is both incredibly nice How and terrifying. Uh, exactly, <laughs> that's the second half of that. He's both incredibly nice and unbelievably intimidating. Like right after uh, uh, Pulp Fiction, like <laughs> it's like, I, "Hi, Mr. Jackson. I'll have her home Hi. by nine thirty. Okay. It's like, oh my God, let's go. <laughs> I can't even imagine. Uh, but yeah. Um, She's wonderful. She's uh, I, I have never met Samuel L. Jackson, but his daughter was wonderful. Um, Zoe was her name. Stop, uh, stop talking about non... I want values and rebounds and, and, and minutes per game, Dan. Uh, the value just, of this story... The data. The value now. of this story was just... Was through the roof. This was like a second round story. Uh, so I thought we could talk just about the, <laughs> the first week of the season. Yeah. It's... It's sample size theater 3000 here on fantasy NBA today. Uh, how, Do you know where that saying came from? Sample size. Th- small no, I don't size actually. Theater? I thought I invented it. <laughs> did you? Probably did you actually? Not. But oh. I really thought I did. Cause like I wrote, was writing about it. I think I named an article about samples, small sample size theater. And then like now everybody's saying it. So well, you, might have. I came up well, you with, did. I don't know. Didn't you come up with cash I, counters? Wasn't that you? That was me. See, that one I, I know for sure. I, I, I mean, I, I was just curious where that came from. I p- clearly didn't make it up. It's, <laughs> it's just everywhere. Yeah. But, but cash it's counters It's everywhere you right now. Yeah. Somebody had to say it the first time. Everybody's got to drop everybody because everybody in week one is worth dropping. Everybody sucks right now, by the way. That's actually not it's, me. Except being, for Miles Bridges. Except for Miles Bridges. That is absolutely true. Miles Bridges does not suck, but everybody else kind of sucks right now. Look at the field goal percents across the NBA. Um, I, I I postulated, Brew, on yesterday's podcast, on Thursday's show, that... Did you, did you clean up when you were done? <laughs> I postulated all over the show. And basically that, because of the way the last... How the hell long has it been now? 19 months, roughly, since the COVID stuff really sunk in. No one really had a break. And so I feel like on a normal offseason, NBA players have a routine where they sort of go into hibernation for a little bit, and then they work on getting their game together, and then they make their improvements, and then they get their conditioning right, and they have training camp. I just get the feeling that players were like, you know what, I don't care that this off season is a month shorter. I'm going to do all of my normal off season stuff. 
And then training camp happened and they were like, crap, what happened to the month where I get back into shape? It's just gone. Is anyone in shape this year besides Miles Bridges? Um, I, I would go, yeah, because like, there's guys that just keep themselves in shape year round. Um, but this has been just a cut above summer league basketball on, on a lot in a lot of these games. Not all of them. Some of these teams have got a core that's played together for a while and, and they're motivated. Like the Warriors are motivated. You the, know, yeah, the to, Heat to looked something pretty good. out of there. But out even there. even on the motivated teams, there's stuff that's that's weird. Like Wiggins hasn't looked himself, and Dre's a slow starter, and even Steph hasn't shot the ball well. What's he shooting right now? Forty three percent. He's put up giant numbers, yeah. but Steph's a 47, 48, 49 percent guy. Even the best of the best aren't making shots right now. I, I mean, none of these numbers matter in a weird way. Like you're looking for big picture things, yes. Um, but like, I think you've, I think you were the one I got this from is that like, if these games happened in February, nobody would even be like caring in the yeah. slightest for, for a two to three game stretch, you know, and, and then we're getting into the fourth and the fifth game. I've always just, you know, whether it's fantasy or reality, you know, I always give like five to 10 games, you know, like I remember Corey Joseph showed up cause I got to bring up that guy, right? <laughs> Corey a, Joseph showed up in poor sack Corey and, he, Joseph. and he looked I know he's probably like a really good dude and he just gets slammed, but that's what you get for playing for the Kings. <laughs> Someone that else. Was your, that was your choice, man. Dude, you people out there, choice. people out there think that you just hate Corey. I, Joseph. Him and Nemanja. It's like, I got like dart boards with those two on them. Okay. We now, we're definitely no, going to have to do it. Is he, he looked slow, right? And it was like, obvious he's slow. He can't do anything. And then it's like, and everybody's jumping on him in Sacramento. And I was like, wait, guys, you got to give him 10 games. Cause like being in basketball shape is so different than just being in regular shape. It takes guys probably three, five games of NBA basketball, regular season basketball, not even practice basketball, like regular season ball to get to that gear. And that's probably the most of what I'm seeing is you're just seeing guys that have no business being out of shape, just sucking wind. Like just like seven minute mark of the first quarter, you know, when it's all just like all that lactic acid is building up and they're just freaking out, you know, they don't have their legs, they don't have their wind. And you're just seeing them like kind of lollygag up and down the floor and they actually get their wind. And then probably at about three or four minutes in the first quarter, they start getting kind of settling in a little bit. So yeah, no, it's it's uh, you know, it's messy. It's messy on an, on the analysis side because you're really trying to separate fact from fiction. I think here's a, here's a fun little analysis game we can play. Look at the look at the first twelve guys on the Yahoo board. It just an overall. Don't have to? Yeah, <laughs> you don't. Kings Island is issuing a fear warning for the city of Cincinnati and the surrounding areas. Halloween haunt will make landfall on September 24th and is expected to induce terror until the 30th of October. All patrons are advised to take caution. Unspeakable horrors are among us, and there's no hope of escape. Halloween haunt, fear is waiting for you. Come and get it. <laughs> Halloween haunt admission is included with your gold pass, or buy a ticket at visitkingsisland.com. Have to. I'll do. I'll do it for you. Uh, Nikola Jokic has been fine. Um, I actually think the shorter off seasons have been good for him because he hasn't had to. He hasn't fully gone Fly into hyper. To... Right. To Serbia and go hang out with the horses. Precisely. Uh, but Steph Curry, forty-three percent. Luka Doncic, who I, you know, we never advocated really as a first rounder in nine cat anyway. But regardless, forty-one percent. James Harden, thirty-six percent. Uh, KD, fifty-five percent. Okay, well, fine. Yeah, the Olympics, whatever. Uh, he's sort of the exception at this point. Dame, thirty-three. Tatum, forty-two. Embiid, 44. Beal, 33. Paul George, 46. The list I could go on pretty much forever. Vooch, 40. I think I think the foul thing is definitely coming into play. And and I did I did discount a couple guys due to the foul thing. I didn't discount James Harden because of the foul thing. Well, they're picking on him. He's they're the picking player. on him. They're picking on Trey. They're picking on the obvious guys, right? It's why but most this, of the foul shots right now are being taken by power forwards and centers in the NBA. 
That's a good point. I, I think hard they, that um, way. I think that the you can't as a team like go into the season thinking like, okay, we're gonna just change everything we do because they might call it tighter or, or looser, however you're looking at it. Uh it's definitely like if you're a defender, you're always like uh, defense was always my thing. So I was kind of like gravitate toward defense. Defense is all is about blood in the water. Like you want to know what can I get away with to the like decimal point. And when you find out that you've got all this leash, you just take as much as you can get. And it happens all across the board. And it's it, basketball is such a network of a game. Like one guy knowing that they can get away with more on the opposite side of the pattern. Like you just, everything changes. Like you're like, okay, so I can now hedge this much more. I can recover this much later. I think that probably is affecting off ball stuff more than, you know, the, like the, the real easy take right now is that the refs aren't calling that stuff. So James Harden's a fraud, you know. Freddie Van Vliet, I think, talked about it. Didn't Van Vliet come out to say, like, nothing is getting called? I've talked to my opponents and nothing's getting called. No one's getting any foul shots. So, like, basically every guard in the league is mad right now. I love it. I absolutely love it. Do you think it I, sticks from a fantasy standpoint, no, reality, no, whatever? No, not at all. <laughs> yeah. Remember, I, remember when they were going to call traveling violations four years ago? How'd that yeah, go? Yeah, they do it for a week, two, three tops, and then, like, they just stop doing it. And I think what you'll see is you'll stop seeing the like sideways jumping three calls. I think that sticks, you know, for the rest of the year. Yeah, and I, I like that actually. Get rid of that nonsense. But a lot of the stuff they're letting go is is people getting clubbed in the lane if it looks weird. <laughs> I think the interesting thing about Harden is like he definitely looked like he was in ten times better shape coming into the season, and yet he's still not all the way there. <laughs> <laughs> I think optically I got fooled a little bit, like, okay, you're thin. So you're in shape, but in reality, he might not be in shape yet. No, well, but I think this a is while. a lot of play. I've watched a lot of guys and I'm just like, man, you're sucking wind. It's the first quarter. Mm -mm. Yeah, that's 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 not you. So you know? what can a fantasy player do with this type of information? Because the names I just read off, I'll, I'll do it again here just for by the way, Steph is still number two in the NBA, despite shooting 43 percent. So we can probably take him off that board. But Harden, number 39 in 9-cat. Dame, 103. Tatum, 49. Beal, 121. Also had an injury, so that playing into it a little bit. Uh, who else am I, did I? Vooch, 38. Michael Porter Jr., 112. He's shooting 35%, by the way. Uh, the I mean, other guy looks like he's sucking wind. Donovan Mitchell, shooting 39%. Devin Booker, 41. De'Aaron Fox, 38. Don, 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 Donovan Mitchell got that uh, Davion Mitchell treatment. <laughs> Mitchell that's on Mitchell. That's Mitchell on Mitchell. He never Mitchell. recovered. Um, yeah, but this is like, I almost read half the names in the top 25 right there. Yahoo's top 25. I know that Yahoo's top 25 is not it's, like the be-all, end-all here, but that's a lot of guys shooting 44% or less. When you look at numbers in the aggregate over a decade, the variations are not that crazy i mean there's this trend line for three-point shooting you know there's this trend line towards like deeper shooting in general so like but like just year to year stuff the wiggle is there but it's not like all the way there so basically if you're gonna say all right this rule change or even the return to fans in the stadium i've seen that one been you know, floated around that that somehow helps defense and such. You're really, it's an uphill bet. I think I just made that term up. That makes no sense. It's a <laughs> tough bet. It's like an uphill climb, but it's a bet. It's both. Uh, I'm on it's board. Like, I'm good with it. Yeah. It's, but you're, it's, it's a, it's a very unlikely bet that there's going to just be this major environmental change in the numbers. So I, I think like, Almost every year, you know, you, you have tremendous value in fading the early action, whatever it might be that it's, you know, if it's overperforming, underperforming, you got to take everything into context, you know, but like Miles Bridges, I had somebody ask me like over under, is he going to have 70% of his production? 
Like there's a couple elements of his production. There's no way he keeps up, you know, at the time that that was, you know, he's come down a little bit. Yeah. Only a little though. (laughs) Only a little, but I mean, and it's also just like, I mean, everything's so contextual. Like right now they're taking LaMelo in and out of games. Like he's a rookie, you know, how long is that going to fly? I mean, LaMelo's like easily probably their best player arguably so like how how often is he gonna get pulled in the fourth quarter because the team's playing well he had a great game the other game they pulled him out because the team was playing well like that's college stuff you know i was a little surprised that perego pulled that but like so what happens when he's on the ball playing 33 minutes a game you know you got terry rosier back you know what's going on with miles bridges at that point because he can post some empty stat lines real quick. So those, uh, those are questions that I would have just for him specifically. And kudos to him. He looks yeah, great. Yeah. It's that's like I hate that we have to do that disclaimer, but we do because we do we root for all of these guys, but we have to also analyze even it the from, Corey Josephs. Even Corey Joseph, but maybe not Nemanja Bialica. <laughs> <laughs> well, not while there's there's super smart a- analysts out there that are wondering why teams haven't given him the keys to the car. EuroLeague MVP. You know, when I knew that that marketing campaign had worked was uh, my college roommate, G-chatted me. He's like, what do you think of Nemanja Bielica? And I was like, what? And he was like, well, there he's the EuroLeague MVP. I'm like, wow, the Warriors got to you, man. Uh, anyway, I, we're... we're, we're it's bad. It feels like we're picking on him. I think we're really picking on this notion the that marketing teams... marketing campaign. Yeah, why, why not just... I always... When my wife is going to make me... Or not make me. Ask me to watch something. I think of like a show or a movie. I say, undersell me. Tell me it's okay. And then I'll go see it. I'll go, oh, that was way better than okay. Why are we not doing that with him? Because he has kind of a fun skill set. Not a good defender, but like moves the ball, spaces the floor, sees the floor pretty well. But then they're like, he's going to be the game changer. And that's just too much yeah, of a he changes burden. the game on defense. <laughs> like the, not... the other team sees him on the floor and they change their entire game plan. And they just go, okay, there, Attack. that guy. He's a capable backup. That's a pretty reasonable. Like, I would love to be a capable backup in the NBA. That's a great, that's a great existence. But it's weird. It happens with guys like Bielitsa. It happens with guys like Rondo. Oh, it Rondo. happens like, it's like there's this certain like, player type that like announcers especially but like you know teams there's bad teams that sell their guys to the local media in an attempt to like pull a curtain over everybody's eyes it's just weird it feels i just thought it was funny coming out of golden state because they're not like that their pr department's like the gold standard in the league and but i think the media was the ones that were doing the marketing there yeah they was like this is this is the game change anyway this is the guy yeah. pull it pulling it back together here because we don't want we, we can don't, do this all day yeah we could do it all day we just we think the whole thing is so damn funny and it sucks that it has to be one particular guy cuz we have obviously nothing at all against Nemanja Bjelica. In fact, he had a year, two seasons back where he had pretty good fantasy value in Sacramento when every other big man was hurt for a year uh but okay let me let me hone in on a couple of things here i'm gonna i'll give you a little sort of like a semi lightning round type of deal but not exactly let's Um, see how many we can hit yeah so we're talking about these players particularly in this upper crust that are off to clunky starts and and my lightning round type of question for you brew is how are there any Maybe this isn't even the lightning round. Maybe this is just honing in. Are are there any of those names that I said that worry you at all on the guys underperforming right now in that upper crust? If you could do me a favor and just rattle them off, I'm going to go to my own list here and just okay. see like the top of the list. Like who at the top is just, you know, so are here... they possibly bugging me? Okay, so I'll give you guys, again, this is off of Yahoo's preseason top 25. So it's not a perfect list, but of those guys, the ones that are I would classify as kind of stinking so far are Luca, Harden, Dame, Tatum, Beal. Uh, Let's let's stop for a second. We'll just hit a couple there. Yeah, because then there's a stretch of guys that are actually doing okay. Damien's like... I don't think he's like, I think he's going to get his numbers, but I do wonder if this is the year that he stops getting them so easily and that if there's some erosion there and I got stuck with him in one league and I was like taking him as the safe play 
and thinking, uh, you know, I just think that this isn't his year, like that it's just going to come back a little bit, like top 10, top 15, something like that. Um, Harden is the one that's like the most interesting to me because you can make an argument if he loses it in the foul shooting category that that has a major detrimental, you know, effect to his value. And then the question that I wrote about in the B150 was like, did he lose a little in his head? Like, you know, losing you know, some of your re repertoire, you know, we saw it in the playoffs. He was so scared to shoot, you know, like, did it happen? So like those two questions create this enormous buy low opportunity for a guy who lapped the field in fantasy leagues just a few years ago. And when I talk about the field, I'm talking about the second place. Yeah. He lapped them. It was like what Jokic did to everybody last year. Jokic did about half of the lapping that <laughs> that Harden did. Right, yeah, eight cat. He really did. He really went yeah, buck yeah. wild. And and so like, you know, we haven't heard from Kyrie in a while. That obviously helps things out significantly for Harden. I think you gotta buy low there. I agree. Yeah, you got you got to look at opportunities like that to get into the top five. So, what about? What if we jump a little farther down the board? Uh, Vooch hasn't been that great so far. He's sort of being floated by a ridiculously you, you high steal Beal. rate. I, yeah, I'm, a, I'm worried about Beal. Injury-wise? In big picture-wise, like the owner came out and said that he's not really all that worried about the contract extension. He's not obsessing over it, was his quote. And that's not what you say to the guy that you're trying to keep. It's like the minute that Beal was not vaxxed, I felt like to me that was the last straw for Ted Leonsis. Hmm. What that's is that? just Could... gut stuff. You know, like I can't tell you that that's what's happening. That's just a gut feeling or instinct. But like. So you would not buy low on Bradley Beal? Probably not. Ooh, saucy. It is. Saucy. I mean, I might not be right on that one, but like, what are you going to pay for him? Top 15, top 20? Yeah, you're going to have to shell out to get him because people don't even really know what he's going to do this year. He, he missed two you games. Know, a few seasons ago, he was a major injury risk. Yeah, and then I, all I, of a sudden he played through everything. I, I think that the, not, him not having a pulse on what he was saying during those press conferences, that really worried me as far as like, what is this guy's decision-making ability like? And if you're a franchise, and this is why I think it comes into play and why Leonce is saying something like that is actually newsworthy in the fantasy world. It's like, look, if you want your, like they talk about De'Aaron Fox in Sacramento, like he's the king, you know, this is Bradley Beal. We're talking about here. Like you want to be like iffy on Bradley Beal. That doesn't add up to me. It almost seems like the writing's on the wall and that they're just, trying to kind of play both sides of the line. Hmm. But if things go south, you know, that that starts to become, okay, I got to look out for me. I might not play through this injury, though Beal has played through a lot, and, and he likes to play. And um, somehow they haven't been that horrible yet. They're three and one. I can't figure that one out. That feels all, like also small sample size theater. They also, they have a lot of guys that want to prove themselves right now. And so if like, you get a guy in Bradley Beal that wants to play, kind of under his own terms, you can see a lot of those other guys just like turning on him a little bit. And then the question becomes like, does he want to be in that locker room? Mm. That's, that's where you get the, like, I'm frustrated. I'm not going to give that 110%, which technically you can't give. If they keep winning, then he almost has to. Yeah. If they keep winning, then he would look like the bad guy if he wasn't trying hard. If they suck and he's not trying hard, then it's kind of like, well, we stink anyway. <laughs> well, and that, you know, and then the, the, the Gafford thing comes in huge. You can't keep playing Harrell at center. Not long term, no. But he does the, have the, that motor, which no one in the NBA has here the first week of the season. He's the anti everything right now. He looks like, you know, kind of like in the spirit of some of the other guys that came across with him, they, they want to get after it because they've been discarded. Yeah. So, players have another gear. You know, hello, Chris Boucher. <laughs> you should be saving for the future, but savings accounts suck, and investing can be scary. We combine the ease of savings with the real returns of investing. 
We call it Save Vesting, and it's only available in our new app, Stairs. Stairs offers 4% to 6% returns, no fees, and you can withdraw anytime. Do your future a favor. Visit StairsApp.com today. At Kings Island, it's never too early to start thinking about next year's fun. That's why we're offering the lowest price of the year on a 2022 Gold Pass right now. That includes unlimited visits this year, so you can enjoy Tricks and Treats Fall Fest, Haunt, and Winterfest. Then unlimited visits next year to try new foods, hang with the Peanuts Gang at Planet Snoopy, scream on our world-class coasters, and splash away at Soap City Water Park, all for as low as $105 plus applicable taxes and fees. Hurry, offer ends October 31st. So get your Gold Pass now at visitkingsisland.com. It's amazing in here. And the, the world, <laughs> guys who don't want to get after it right now, piles on you and says that you suck. It's like, whoa, okay, yeah, back to the drawing board. And I'm telling you that that game Boucher played last night, I was watching it like a hawk. Obviously, we're invested. It's it was it was great to watch him make every little play. Like he went low. He stuff. went low usage for the first time in his entire career. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And he did some of these things in front of Nick Nurse, and you could see Nick Nurse kind of like clapping. And he even said that he played some lineups to get Boucher going. So it was a classic, like, short-term, I'm going to nail you over the head with this, and then I'm going to, like, you know, give you a hug afterwards, is the PG version. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Can we, can Boucher get to... The 24 minutes or so. That, oh, yeah, he okay. can. The question is, when is it going to happen and how is it going to happen? And, you know, Precious looks good. Like, that. that's one thing that, like, in terms of weighing out upsides, like, Precious looks good, and that's going to keep Boucher in a sort of, like, you got to keep showing me category. And for B- Boucher, he's just got to be, like, just solid like and what i mean by that like defensively just keep doing what you do defensively and then kind of the other stuff isn't going to matter so much and defensively i didn't think he was like super bad but like you can't go out and chuck the way he was chucking the way he was chucking is something i haven't seen in the nba in a really long time and that's that's saying something because there's guys that come in on a 10 day that you know, or whatever Chucker is doing, whatever Chucker things like he took like shots where like everybody in the NBA knows that you just make this next pass because it's the next pass you make. And he was just out there taking those shots. And I think he <laughs> felt that pressure. <laughs> like, you know, precious looks good. He's taking your position, your back, your, you know, you had the injury time off. So you didn't get a chance to prove yourself. You think the only way that you can prove yourself is shooting. Unfortunately, that that's his mindset. Yeah, that doesn't usually work when you're on a team that's now attempting to win games again, which they kind of weren't last year. Raptors right. were just like, we're too beat up, man. It's just not going to happen. We're in Tampa. We're not happy. We're two-thirds they of the way to the season. They they were all cooked. They Everybody's like, oh, the Raptors are tanking. I was like, no, if you read the articles on them last year, they were resting guys because they were literally too tired to play. They were worried they were going to end up hurt. So they just sat the whole team for like a week. And the interesting thing about the whole Boucher thing is like the difference between Boucher and Precious, if they're playing the same defensively and on the glass, is night and day. And the reason why you see those Pascal Siakam numbers that are, you know, so flattering to uh to Boucher is because he just he can space the floor and he can dive. So like with Precious out there. I mean, Precious isn't afraid of an 18-footer, but, like, are you respecting that? And teams, like, it's funny. You can be a kind of a bad shooter, you know, it's like a 37 38%, 36% shooter, but if teams know that that ball's coming out the minute you get it, they're so afraid of the three-point shot that they will give you the gravity that you're asking for. And so when you have Boucher out there in the corner, I mean, you just cannot help off of him the way that you can help off of Precious. Right, or so Birch, or Birch. Yeah, or Birch. So, like, the question really it sits in Boucher's hands, and that's why when I made my rank, it was like, okay, what's Boucher going to be all about this year? You know, did he learn lessons? Did he, 
get things figured out. And I just thought it was hilarious that he didn't learn the lessons. <laughs> But, but that like learning. they just were immediately like, dude, no, yeah, this not, is a new you're year. You're not gonna, you're not gonna do it. And the, getting that part out of the way early, to me, is 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 kind of a silver lining of the slow start. And um, steals and blocks and all that stuff, like those are coming. His shot profile to me is not changing, you know, too much. And maybe there's a little bit less on the table for him because precious is a good player um one thought one thing about the entire landscape not just about chris boucher we have not seen any attrition on any of these teams and all of these teams are trying to feel each other out you know and some more than others you mentioned vooch earlier you know those guys in chicago are going to have you know their hands full for a little bit figuring out what they're all about indiana same thing like you know rick carlisle's out there playing uh, what's his name? Brogdon, 39 minutes a game, and nobody on that team looks like they know what they're doing. So you're going to see somebody like a Chris Boucher step into minutes one way or another because somebody is going to get hurt out there. So for him, it's like two prong. One is like he can get it, you know, that way, which isn't as much earned. But as long as he just. Like as long as the message gets through to him that like play defense, get on the glass, don't take every three, don't take every shot that comes your way. Just take like two thirds of them. Yeah, some. Then he's gonna be fine. And there's too much upside there to be considering a drop. Like if you're considering a drop of that guy, like you play in a ten team league, and and you've clearly not done fantasy that long. <laughs> I descri- I've described it. I think as. He has the look of the, like the guy who the gets the most, yeah, most regrettable drop of the year, which is I, that, I, that burn that that like once you once that guy is your guy, you never make that mistake again. You know, I did that with mean, Rob Covington four years ago, and I'll never make that mistake again. We had Jokic that one year. That's why I posted those numbers so people could just see kind of like everybody said drop the guy, except for us. We said buy low. Yep, and. That's, um, you know, that was because Jokic was obviously a special player that we recognized was a special player, and and it looked bad for him. It looked bad. He didn't look as special, and he finished top 20. It just, you kind of got to let these things play out a little bit. You know, some plays are, you know, some plays like with Boucher, like he gets a ton of leash for all the reasons we've discussed. Like Patrick Williams, like that guy will find out. But you got to give him two to three weeks and and see, like, where is this guy at? Like, right now he's coming off injury, you know, an ankle injury that he kind of beat his timetable on. And then there was a local report guy. It's like 50,000 followers. I have no idea who this guy is. Um, he's followed by some mutuals. So it's, it's like a, not a total unknown. But he said sources tell him that there's a shoulder injury that he's playing through. And he just wants to be there for the team. And one of the things that we mentioned about Patrick Williams is he's the only guy at his size, really, for the Bulls. So they can draw up these four guard lineups, you know, in the first month of the season and, you know, get some guys like Caruso on the floor more, you know, and, and not, but even it's funny, even with a bad Patrick Williams, they still gave him like 27 minutes the other night. They have to play the guy. So the question just becomes like, did he get completely rattled by all of the changes you know, is he upset for any reason, you know, that he's not going to get the touches that, you know, he thinks maybe he deserves at this stage in his career. And most people close to Chicago say, no, this guy's just a hard worker. He doesn't have those issues. So like for me personally, I'm, I'm sitting back <clears throat> and, and I'm just like, I want to see, does he get his wind back? Does he have any injury issues that are lingering? Cause otherwise he's plug and play for these minutes and, then you come back to like, is there a great change in the stat set this year? Typically the answer for most players is no. So we'll see with him. So you kind of got to measure out the context of the situation and, you know, and really figure out what's going on. But like early week stuff, like or first week stuff, I just kind of laugh at that stuff. Cause 
I'm actually kind of mad at Rick Carlisle because I have Malcolm Brogdon in a few spots. I thought he was a pretty good deal at like 60 or wherever he was starting to go. And then I was like, what are you doing? You played him 44 and 41 minutes on a back-to-back. You know he's not going to survive the next week. That's and been so we bizarre. Like, and, and they're just the philosophy of the offensive approach there. Like, It's been a lot of just Malcolm go you know, take your guy one on one. Yeah, it's been great for me having Malcolm Brogdon on my team, <laughs> but I also well, you just wonder I've, who it's coming from. Is that like management? Because Malcolm kind of won the battle. He's been a weird enigma in Indy. Like, but he he's was also so been pro. hurt a lot. He's been hurt a lot in his young career. Anyway, whatever. I don't, we don't need to go down career. the Malcolm Brogdon rabbit hole. I actually want to ask you one more question on the buy low, sell high stuff before I let you go today. Um, this is something that I that I struggle with actually, and I I try to work through it. But until you fully understand the way a league or or the public views a player, it's really hard to put the pieces and make them fit. So, like, if you were trying to buy low on a James Harden, what do you think would get it done? I struggle with that side of the of the thing. I think you kind of need like a hyper overperforming guy that was drafted no later than like 25 just because a name power alone you can't offer up something clunkier than that even if they're playing really well it's not like cj mccollum is number three right now but that's not going to get it done because cj mccollum was drafted at 50 uh it, it has to be like lamello or yeah something like that would, would lamello get it done 73 and a half percent from the free throw line just throwing that out there that's true although it fluctuates. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Um, I'm, you know, looking at the names, man, you could do something crazy in a league where like people don't understand John Morant. You can maybe throw John Morant out there. Like that's just a crazy, like not for intermediate leagues recommendation right there. <laughs> um, yeah. It was like JV's number 13, but that's not going to get it done. Would Paul George, yeah, is, it, is it worth it? it, it to someone like PG, or is he going to be too good this year? Well, we had Paul George really high, and I don't know. If yeah, we, I'm pretty sure we beat everybody on Paul George. Um, we had Butler but high, like, he also, doesn't have, didn't we? I know I did. <laughs> those two guys, they're just known as not at that tier. So, like, you might not be able to pull off a buy low. Yeah, that's Harden. that's what's so hard about it. It's really difficult without knowing the individual league. So I was throwing names out there like Lamelo is number 22 in nine cat right now i know he had the bad game so maybe it's not the perfect time to do like it luca or something yeah even maybe. though even though he's like he's kind yeah. of a low well he's where we think he should be luca's number 26 in nine cat right now and that's kind of where it tends to end up with this stuff but this is a hard so question people, isn't it people people would be all over that lebron yeah, at 20 would, would that get person? it done who lebron Zach Levine, those guys right around 20 right now, would they get it done? I mean, I don't... Both of them are dinged up. Yeah. Levine's got this torn tendon in his hand or whatever it is. You probably got to pull the old two for one, but, you know. Then you really got it. Yeah, see, it's hard. This is a really tough one. Those buy lows on the first rounders are, you just have to pry so hard. I feel like the buy lows on a like an underperforming second or third rounder are, doesn't seem like it would be that much easier, but I think it is exponentially simpler. People are much more willing to panic on a second rounder than a first. Aren't they? I think so. It's a sell high season. Yeah. Harris, go it's get whatever really, you can I mean, for Harrison Barnes and Miles Bridges. That If you take nothing else away from today's show, go get what you can for those dudes. Yeah. There's, yeah. A, there's quite a few sell high guys in here. Yeah. You already mentioned Ja, or I would have thrown him there in there again. Are those the three? Yeah, Are those you know, the three? Like, like, you know, somebody like Evan Mobley might be somebody that you could. The Cavs are like, kind of fun. Th- Cavs are fun, but like, is he going to block two shots a game? No. Probably not. Is he going to shoot 90 from the line on yeah. four times a game? Probably <laughs> no. not. No. Yeah. I mean, I like him as a player, but I mean. All right, let's do this. So I have an idea. There's names all over the place. All right, let's, let's take this to the masses as a nice way to transition from Friday pod to weekend activity. Uh, Brew and I will do some stuff. We'll have a little fun on Twitter with sell highs and buy lows. We'll get some polls going and we'll try to help you guys match up your trades. How does that sound? Is that a good weekend activity for us? Dude, you're, you're the, you're the man. I'm trying the the social. I'm trying. Seriously. (laughs) 
I don't Keep... even want to hire a social guy because you're so good. No, you can still do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man i love it ah he's the big dog gonna, what, who am i gonna hire that's better than you oh i gotta be worse this is what i'm talking about you have to set the bar low it's all about expectations it's man. all about expectations there you go i got the name of the podcast sealed up right there big Lowered dog here i got a treat for you big dog <laughs> arf, arf. speak <laughs> brew i'll talk to you next week later on the great aaron brewski the great Aaron Bruski, our boss here at Hoopball, and also a legend of fantasy basketball. We recorded that show, um, that segment, I should say, yesterday before the games took place. So a couple things changed in between there. Uh, but take a lot of that and, and file it in your things to remember department. Please, friends, take a moment to rate and review the podcast. It would continue to mean the absolute world to me if you write something funny. As I've said, I'll... Try to read it here on this show. If you don't, that's okay, too. You don't have to write something funny. But just pull up the podcast app on your mobile device or the podcast in iTunes. Search for Fantasy NBA Today. Click on the show title. Drop five stars on it. And I'll blow you a kiss. Let's have some fun over on social media. Again, I am at Dan Bespris over there. Show's coming up this weekend. We got a couple more. Two more in the month of October. 31 shows, 31 days. We are almost there and then we start November with five shows in a row as well. So it's really 36 shows in 36 days because I'm an idiot. Well, maybe I'll skip that Monday. I feel like I've earned one day, haven't I? No? You said no? Ah, you guys are jerks. Okay, we'll talk to you tomorrow. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.